This ad is about AT&T's deal on the new iPhone 15 Pro, and it's real, guaranteed. That's not always the case with other ads. The view of a lifetime. Only with a pricey upgrade. Breathe in to find inner peace. Then pay extra to remove the ads. At AT&T, we mean what we say. Learn how to get iPhone 15 Pro with titanium on us with eligible trade-in. Guaranteed. Connecting changes everything. AT&T. See att.com slash iPhone for details about the guaranteed trade-in promo for new and existing customers. Available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me is a man that told me very recently he would be extremely lucky to last 48 seconds in the ring against a woman. (laughs) It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Welcome to part two of the Jacob Wetterling case. We got so much to talk about that we thought we'd put out two episodes this week because we love you. And this week's Beer of the Week is Redacted Rye IPA by Renegade Brewing Company from beautiful Denver, Colorado, garage grade four out of five bottle caps. Redacted is a rye IPA. It's Renegade's flagship beer, and it has citrusy hops and spicy rye, which is a fantastic combo. And this week's beer is brought to us by Sheldon from Portage La Prairie, Shannon from Albany, New York, Anthony, who says he is happy to be back in his home state of Georgia, and he's taking his true crime garage with him. Yo, Anthony. We also have Melissa in Mint Hill, North Carolina. Melissa, she says that we help her through her workday, and she loves the captain's voice. Mm. Also, we have Deborah from New York. Deborah asked if we could cover the double initial murders from Rochester and recommends a beer from Genesee. Now, I'll tell you what, Deborah, we actually covered that case. Back in season two, so it's only available on the iTunes store or on our website. Uh, but we titled it The Alphabet Murder. So check that out. And I also recommend to you, check out the book, uh, The Misbegotten Son. I think we've recommended that one before, but it's about Arthur Shawcross, who was a Rochester serial killer. And last but not least, we have Janine from Washington, who says, you guys are so addicting. So thank you all for helping out this week. And if you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. We're like a drug. We like your jib. Follow us on social media, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, untapped if you're a beer drinker at True Crime Garage. And if you want to purchase the Alphabet Murders or any of our old episodes, mm-hmm. do that at the iTunes store or you could do that on our website, truecrimegarage.com. Yeah, and we had a couple issues with PayPal, but we think we got those figured out now. Oh, we've gotten them straightened out over there. Yeah, I held them down and I said, I'm going to straighten out your jib. You should have put them in an arm bar. I did. Right. <laughs> the Ronda Rousey arm bar. Yeah. All right, Captain, that's enough of the business. So everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. We start this morning with breaking news in the Jacob Wetterling investigation. Sources say the suspect in the case led the FBI to remains that are now being tested for DNA. 
In the last 40 minutes, Patty Wetterling texted WCCO's Esme Murphy, our hearts are broken, we have no words. WCCO's Jennifer Merrily learned of these significant developments in the last two days, and she joins us now with more. Jen? The man named as a suspect in Jacob Wetterling's abduction led FBI agents to where he says they'll find the missing boy's body. We have heard they have found remains. This all happened in the last few days as agents pressed Danny Heinrich for information on the nearly 27-year-old mystery. Sources tell me that the FBI took Heinrich out of jail at least twice this week. It's during that time that Heinrich told investigators where they'd find Jacob's body. We know searchers have been at a site in Stearns County for several days. 11-year-old Jacob Wetterling was on his way home from Tom Thumb with his brother and a friend on October 22, 1989, when he was abducted by a man with a gun. The attacker told the two other boys to run and not look back or he'd shoot them. Jacob was never seen again. Danny Heinrich was arrested last October at his home in Annandale. Prosecutors charged him with several counts of child pornography and named him as a person of interest in Wetterling's kidnapping. We'll have more on just how early Heinrich was looked at in this case in a moment. But again, sources tell me that the man suspected of kidnapping Jacob Wetterling has told authorities where they'll find his body. Searchers have been at that site for the last few days. Heinrich was also scheduled to be in Minneapolis federal court yesterday at 2.30. We were prepared to be there. That court hearing was canceled early yesterday. It really is a stunning development, Jen. It is. All right. Thank you. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your master chef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. Jacob Wetterling, 11 years old, along with his brother Trevor and a friend Aaron, went to their local video store around 9 p.m. on Sunday, October 22, 1989. Now, as the boys rode their bikes home, a man suddenly emerged from a wooded area with a gun, and he forced the boys to the ground. First, he told Trevor to run and not look back, and then he told Aaron to do the same. When the boys did look back, the man was gone, and their friend and brother, Jacob Wetherling, was gone as well, without a trace. Now, that was 1989. Where we left off was 2003, where the Dan Rassier was on the hot seat. He had become a big part of the investigation. Uh, some would call him a suspect. He lived right by the crime. Yeah, he talked to police officers that night, and he was a local music teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the following year, they get another tip. Okay, We were going through tips that were coming in. And one of those tips is what led them to believe Dan Rassier could have committed this crime. But that following year, we get another tip. This time, it's a man in his late 20s 
who lived in Cold Spring as a child. Cold Spring, Minnesota is about 12 or so miles from St. Joseph, where Jacob's hometown was and where he had disappeared from. The man's name is Jared. Uh, And you can look it up and you can find Jared's last name. But for the majority of this investigation and for the majority of the times that he comes forward to media, uh, he's simply known as Jared will give him that respect. Um, Jared comes forward and he says, you know, he has a story very similar to Jacob's. Jared was abducted. The man had a gun. The man threatened to kill Jared. Um, And from my understanding, this was a bit of old news for some of the investigators whom had known about this attack the whole time. Mm -hmm. This attack, yes, it took place nine months before and 12 miles away from the abduction, but Jared as a boy was even interviewed additional times after he was attacked. They, They started reviewing his case again and went back and interviewed him again. I believe this was about six weeks after Jacob was taken because the attacks sounded so similar. Yeah, there were so many similarities. Mainly, the verbiage of the attacker was was the same. Jared was abducted by a man in a car. The car had stopped to ask Jared for directions. Mm-hmm. Jared got closer to the car when the man stepped out of the vehicle and he said, "I have a gun and I'm not afraid to use it. Get in the vehicle." The man inside of his car he had a police scanner. Mm. He drove Jared to a remote. I, I take back my comments about wanting to get a police scanner. I yeah, don't I don't want one anymore. I think bad guys are using these for 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 bad purposes. Yeah, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not going to buy one of those. No. So after he has the young boy in the vehicle, he drives Jared to a remote location and he sexually assaults him. Uh, he then drives Jared back toward the town where he had taken him from. Mm-hmm. Now, all this time he, that he's driving him back there, he keeps asking him, asking Jared over and over again. Can you recognize me? Do you know who I am? Would you be able to recognize me? Questions like of that nature. Mm -hmm. And Jared very wisely constantly, he just says, no, no, I wouldn't be able to recognize you. I don't know who you are. I I, I don't know what you look like. And it's probably because of this that Jared was able to uh, live to tell his story. Right. He was released. Yeah. So Jared was just 12 at the time. You know, roughly the same age as Jacob Wetterling. Jacob Wetterling was 11. Uh, And he and his parents would eventually move away from Cold Spring sometime after Jacob was abducted. Because even though he had reported the crime to the police and his parents had reported the crime to the police, it it was, this is a tough thing for a kid to go through. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if it's any easier. Tough thing. I mean, I don't even know if tough is the right word. Well, for obvious reasons, right, but right, right. but for the reason that I'm going to get into is there's there's other kids, you know, and kids can be cruel. Um, yeah. And he he's getting pulled out of this is after Jacob has been abducted. He's getting pulled out of class constantly to be interviewed. You mm-hmm. know, no, they never really said they had announced that there was a similar attack on a boy that took place about nine months before Jacob was abducted. Yeah. And but they never they didn't say who the boy was. You know, mm-hmm. rightfully so. But when you're getting pulled out of class and you're seen talking to the sheriff's department yeah, time speculate. and time again, yeah. they they get a good idea that you're that boy. Um, and sometimes sometimes kids can pick on a, a child that's a victim uh, because they don't understand, uh, they don't know any better. To be honest with you, or or yeah, they're, or they're just or they're dumb, mean kids. Right, they're dickheads. You know, <laughs> I mean, how many how many kids did you go to school with that were just super dickheads? Well, eventually Jared and his parents move away. And part of that may be because of the kids. Part of it may be because of the investigators. Um, And he does kind of tell them who. Well, I wonder too, if there was, this kid has this fear Mm -hmm. of this, this attacker, you know, he's sexually assaulted by this guy. And then the attacker is saying, can you recognize me? And now with this other kid going missing, I wonder if there was a thought or some, maybe he was scared that this attacker was going to come back after him. I think you're exactly right. Moving away is a form of defense and getting your child out of there. Um, and, and especially now because the stakes have been raised because yeah. th- this guy could have, could have done this to somebody else. And this child has never resurfaced again. Um, I think you're exactly right there. He eventually moves away, but it's in 2003, 2004 that he comes forward to remind everybody, you know, I was attacked nine months before and it was very apparent to me by the questions that the investigators were asking me that 
my case was probably related to Jacob's case. And if, if this guy assaulted me and he assaulted mm-hmm. Jacob, he probably did this to other boys as well. We might be able to get enough people to come together, tell their bits and pieces of their story that they know of. And maybe we can figure out who this guy is. I mean, we're talking about Jared was able to give some specific details. He gave a yeah. description of the vehicle saying that the man had a police scanner in the car and give a, give somewhat of a description of the man himself. Yeah. And I think also having it be 14 years later, I mean, maybe there's a, there's a possibility that he's resurfacing to go, Hey, look, if this happened to anybody else come forward now and maybe, at 12 years old or 14 years old or, or whatever age that this takes. Ha- if, if somebody approached you when you were 12, maybe you're not likely to come forward um, and, and tell the police about it. But maybe 14 years later, you'll go, Hey, I had this thing happen mm-hmm. and, and I saw this guy yeah. or this guy came up on me and told me he had a gun, but I ran away. Yeah. Or maybe you had somebody that tried to grab you, but wasn't successful. And you, right. you have a description of that man in the vehicle that he was in. You know, these little things can matter. These details can matter. Um, in 2009, though, we're talking about tips and leads here. In 2009, in my opinion, we get the strangest lead in this case so far. In this very lengthy case, an investigation would come. This strange lead would come about in January of 2009, all the way from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And mm-hmm. we're going to bring in my, one of my favorite characters in this whole case. Now, on December of the previous year, mm-hmm. uh, a St. Francis barber, he was 62 years old. His name's Vernon Seats. And he tells his psychiatrist that he had killed two boys back in 1958. And I want to throw this in here, though. I I found several accounts of what the doctor said. Right. Uh, On one occasion, she says that that Vernon Seats had said he had killed two boys in 1958. On another account, she says that he had said 1959. So this man tells his psychiatrist that he had killed two boys in 1958 and or 1959. Right, and who is this guy? This is the guy that we talked about in part one, where uh, we talked about the psychics that were coming to the Wetterly family and trying to get some information and saying, hey, uh, give me uh, some of his clothing and maybe I can uh, see something for you and maybe I can give you a psychic reading. He is one of those uh, guys that were claiming to be a psychic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he would drive, it's like over 400 miles to get to uh, the Wetterling house. Right. And, and, and meet with Patty Wetterling on two occasions and tell her that I'm a psychic. I, uh, you know, I'm trying right. to get some information mm-hmm. on the abduction. And by the way, here's a painting that I did of, of your abducted son. Right. Jacob. So we, this, we got this guy claiming to be a psychic. We, like we said, he was a barber. And then he uh, admits to his doctor that he killed kids. Now you would start thinking, well, maybe he he has to be a, somebody that we need to look into further on the Jacob case. Mm-hmm. Now, I know some people out there are thinking, well, what about, you know, doctor client privileges here? You know, should this doctor be notifying the police? But I, I and I don't know what what the law is exactly on that. I'm sure there's some legal jargon that I wouldn't understand. But the psychiatrist says that the reason why she came forward was because she he had been see, seeking her help for quite some time. This right. was not their first interaction. This yeah. is somebody that he had been going to for a while. Mm-hmm. She says months. I don't know exactly how many months. But she said that the reason why she notified the police is so that they can speak with Vernon Seats because he is ready to make a confession. Well, mm-hmm. before the police can get to Mr. Seats to interview him, he actually dies of natural causes. That's very I mean, odd. Yeah. yeah. And you would think that the strangeness ends there, but it does not. Uh, given the information that he may have killed two boys in 1958 or 1959, mm-hmm. uh, the police get a search warrant to search Mr. Seats' home and property. Now, keep in mind, he died in his home. Um, here's a list of the items that were found in Vernon Seat's home. Okay. Uh, first off, oh, hold on. I'm, I'm preparing myself to be creeped out. I don't know what you're going to say. And I'm going to warn you in advance. This is a long list. Okay. okay so don't I'm ready. Don't get mad at me here. Uh, I'm already mad. <laughs> I'm always mad at you. First, they found newspaper articles, posters, and laminated photos. Now, some of these posters were laminated as well. Right. And notes on some cardboard boxes uh, one of one of these posters, missing persons po- posters that they found, 
was of Jacob Wetterling, and it had been laminated. They also found children's shoes. Now, keep in mind, this man lived alone. Okay, yeah, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't have a. He didn't have a big family or or uh, children living with him. They found children's shoes. Well, thank God. One shoe was a size two and a half. The other shoe was a size three and a half. Both contained DNA and were later sent for testing. They also found several books on cannibalism. One of them was titled Eat Thy Neighbor. Uh, they found a small round that, bone. That is not a recommended reading, by the way. No, no, it's not. <laughs> um, they also found a small round bone, uh, okay. you know, and this was sent for testing as well. They found mm. brown patches of human hair, blonde patches Fuck. of human hair, black patches of human mm-hmm. hair. They found rings and necklaces, which didn't seem accurate for a man living by himself, a flesh colored candle with a catheter attached to it covered in some strange brown substance. They found bondage straps and chains hanging from the inner rafters of the Mm -hmm. home, handcuffs, a box full of negatives. This was, these were later sent to be developed pictures of unknown children, a picture of a boy holding a fish that was dated July, 1959 uh-huh. An Illinois road map with two locations circled on it. They found a map of Millstream Park. This is a location that is near Jacob's abduction. They found photos, paintings, and drawings of children being sexually tortured. Uh. A novel that was written by Vernon Seats named Innocent Rage. A thirty-eight caliber gun. What was that book about? I, I don't know. I did. That's Who yeah. knows? Yeah, I'm not going to buy that on Amazon. Um, and they also found, you know, we talked about notes and missing persons posters, uh, and newspaper articles about missing kids. Some of those kids that were, that he had a built this collection of were of Sandy Bertalis and she was not a child. She was 20 years old. Sandra went uh, missing in April of 1988 from a Mm -hmm. bowling alley. Uh, this was in Wisconsin after telling her friends and family that she was going there to confront a man that she was dating for cheating on her and giving her a false last name and home address. Uh, her car was later found in a in the parking lot of this bowling alley, abandoned. She's yeah. never been found. Um, also amongst these newspaper articles and posters was that of Cora Jones. Uh, she was 12 years old. 12-year-old Cora Jones was kidnapped while riding her bike in 1994. But this was by a, by a known sex offender. This was a case that was was solved. Uh, he later pled guilty to, to the murder of the young girl. Uh, they well, also, obviously that this guy has obsession with kids. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, uh, I mean the, the shoe thing is super strange. The patches of the hair, super strange. And you and, don't have a hair collection at your house. Fuck no, man. That's no. Uh, if so anybody you, tells you they collect hair, yeah, report uh, them to somebody. Yeah, one time I was at a party and this guy said I collect hair, and I said oh, I'm fucking out of there. I just <laughs> dropped my beer and just left. No, that never happened. But no, so obviously is he's into this, but you know, I wonder if he's using these like missing children cases and these clippings as like some sort of like uh, pornography. Yeah, you know, I mean, like you know, because you can have. I mean, is that technically pornography if it's like in written form? But maybe he like fantasizes about, you know, and that's why he was visiting the Wetterling family, you know, to get all these details. And maybe there was some kind of sexual thing that he got off on about this. Well, and they found, you know, of the drawings we talked about, they found drawings that uh, were of. Right. Of torture. Yeah. yeah. Of, of torture or of, you know, sex with children, mm-hmm. um, things like that. And of course, the the immediate thought is that he drew them himself. Um Amongst the the other people that were of concern was Michael Dunahy. He was uh, five years old. He was abducted um, from a playground in Mm -hmm. Victoria, British Columbia in March of 1991. Michael was last seen around 1230 p.m. playing at the school playground uh, as his mother, Crystal, was participating in a softball tournament to which his father was a spectator. You know, so his parents were there as well. Michael was abducted meters from his parents but no witnesses to his disappearance and no one involved in that has ever been identified. Michael was never found or seen again. And the other person of concern is Melissa brain. Now she was five years old. Uh, Melissa went missing from a party at her apartment complex in Virginia. A groundskeeper was later charged and convicted with her abduction. 
uh, but Melissa was never found. So it's obvious here, Captain, that Vernon Seats was not responsible for some or all of these cases, but right. it is also clear by the items that are found in the home uh, that that this is of some very big concern here. Yeah, this is very you alarming. Know, this goes beyond the level of weird. You know, he was a 62-year-old barber. He had passed away. Um, there were reports that, that uh, oh, I thought you said 52 before I, I, I may missed, have, I apologize, yeah, you might have missed, but. uh, but there were reports that there was fresh cement, which was recently poured, oh, uh, <laughs> over be some careful how you say that word. Cause I thought you were going somewhere else with that. Oh no, there were, there was fresh cement that was poured in his basement. Um, and there was also fresh dirt that looked to be, have been overturned, mm. uh, underneath heavy snowfall. This is out in his yard. Um, these, what do you think his house smelled like? Mm. Oh God. And think about all the, okay. So this makes a lot more sense. The hair sample. I wasn't putting two and two together. If he's a barber, then he's, but that's creepy. He's cutting some kid's hair and then he's taking it home with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I bet it smelled like, uh, I bet it smelled like, uh, weird egg smell mixed with pomade. (laughs) Yeah, uh, who who knows? They 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 end up the police end up coming into the house with a jackhammer later because they want to get to this fresh cement to see if right, there's anything yeah. underneath of it. They spent a good amount of time, uh, you know, breaking up that cement floor mm-hmm. and found nothing. Um, and they checked the yard; they found nothing. Um, and furthermore, they couldn't find, um, you know. They couldn't find any link to him to any of these people that he had specific posters of. Right, right. Um, but there's a little, a little more follow up to that. Um, unfortunately, this is a story that came out in 2009, and it was very hot when it came out. And there's not a whole lot of explanation for these items as we sit here now in 2017. Well, and then like like we said, he had that connection with the family going there, telling them that he was a psychic, and so it's like, is this going to uh, be is this going to be the smoking gun that solves this Jacob Wetterling case? You know, obviously we know that it's not mm-hmm. now, but but then it opens up this whole other can of worms. And so, what if he's talking to his doctor and saying, "Hey, I, I killed these boys," I I believe that I believe whatever he's saying there was true, unless because and maybe he didn't kill anybody else after that. I'm, I'm not saying that he didn't. I'm just saying this possibility. And so I wonder if he like said, okay, well, you know, in in 58 or 59, I killed these kids. But, but then ever since that time, maybe he's like, that's not self-medication, but he's like, well, if I just dive into these cases and and surround myself with these other cases, I'm kind of living vicariously through these other cases. And then, so I'm not killing or, you know, not molesting or whatever he's doing it's rare um but there's also the possibility of some kind of mental health issue i mean obviously there's a mental health issue but i mean to the point of where he might believe things to have happened that did not take place yeah um there is one account um he Mm -hmm. as said he was a barber and so at his business the next door neighbor was a salon and the salon owner told the media on several interviews that she had many interactions with Vernon Seats. Mm-hmm. That when when times were slow at the barber shop, he would come next door. He'd have a cup of coffee, and he always wanted to talk about his life. And she said, "You know, his life as, sounds like a typical man." As he described it, was was tragic, strange, and bizarre. Uh, you know, because he went into some detail with her, stating that you know. When I was a child, when I was about 14, this would roughly be around 1958, 1959, uh-huh. that I was abducted. Somebody had taken me. He, he was from Racine, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. And he said that he was abducted there by an older man. And the man had had another boy that was abducted as well. And through the course of this abduction, he was sexually assaulted and he was made to kill the other boy using a gun. Jesus. Um, he later says that that during that same abduction that he witnessed the death of another boy. So it's it's unclear of mm-hmm. him saying that he killed two boys back in 58 or 59, that if it was his hands that did the killing, or if he pulled the trigger on one of the boys, forced to do so, and then right. witnessed the death of another. The other thing, too, though, is he doesn't really stop there. He, he, he has told the salon owner that... Um, mm-hmm. that 
a few years ago, a man broke into my home and I killed him. I shot him dead. Right. Um, so the, he has had multiple homicides, um, whether he was well, forced to do them or, or self-defense or what. Or maybe it's all made up in his head, right? Yeah, and the thing here is the, the detectives looked into this, and I don't know if these were detectives specifically involved in the Jacob Wetterling case, but I do know that Milwaukee detectives in Wisconsin looked into it. Mm-hmm. And the problem that they had with this whole scenario was that they couldn't find any record or any any cases that were even seem somewhat related to uh, Vernon Seat's stories. You know, they couldn't find any record of him actually being abducted. They couldn't find or track any mysterious deaths of young boys in 58 or 59. Right. So either he just made this up or he, he was a victim Mm -hmm. and he didn't come forward and he didn't talk about it. And because of that trauma, he's been wrestling with all these demons in his, in his head. Well, his sister-in-law, Susan Seats, came, uh-huh. tried to defend him uh, post-mortem, you know, let's say, uh, tried to defend him saying that he was, she believed that he was abducted. Uh, she doesn't right. believe that he killed anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, she thinks that this abduction uh, may have created some strange sexual attractions to younger people mm-hmm. um, and that it also developed some kind of psychosis where he became obsessed with with child abductions where he would follow them in the news and follow them in the media and drive 400 miles to go talk to the victim's mother. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, we we've talked about this before that, you know, a a kid becoming a victim of this can lead for them to become the monster, Mm -hmm. you know, not all the time, but it does happen. So he doesn't seem to have been linked to any of the people that we named here specifically, but I did find some, uh, some weird stuff on him, you know, because 1959, he would have been young. You know, it wasn't like he was an old man out abducting little Mm -hmm. kids. He was 14 or 15 years old. Now there is, there was a boy who, a young boy, I think I don't have the age right in front of me, but I want to say it was like five, six, seven in that age range that had gone missing from a campground in Mobile, Alabama. Um, This would have taken place uh, in July of that year of 1959. Now, remember we said that he had a, a picture of a boy holding a fish um, for, that was dated July 1959. Mm-hmm. And the weird thing here is that Vernon Seats had family members. Uh, I believe it was his grandparents that lived somewhat in the area. So that's a strange, you know, we can't connect him to some of these other people, but that's a strange, weird situation here. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that anything came of this because, and I'm believing that nothing came of this to solve any cases because they took evidence for testing right? and we've, we've not heard the results. So usually that means it's a negative. It's, you know, they're not able to link him to anything. Yeah. And again, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, he had some sick thoughts going through his head and there is a part of you that would feel bad for him. If he, if he was traumatized, if he was sexually molested himself, then, then there's a part of you that feels bad for him because then, he, then he's dealing with this trauma and he never seeked uh, professional help. And, and and maybe that's why he was talking to the doctor in the first place. Mm-hmm. But at that point, it's a little too late. Um, either way, I mean, there, there's some sick thoughts in that guy's head. It's a, it's a very strange story and one that got everybody in St. Joseph, Minnesota in an uproar. You know, well, it's such a crazy, you know... Uh, connection with this case yeah that he actually drove there right spoke to the mother and, made, drew, and drew, drew a picture this leads us up to 2010 captain let's go back to the gentleman coming forward that he had driven to the crime scene you know we we said that they had always you know dan rassier says that i saw a vehicle at the end of my driveway turn around yeah. dan dan is the music teacher yep and then we we don't know who this ghost car belongs to you know Mm -hmm. we we don't know but there's a gentleman that comes forward and states i was driving by the crime scene because i heard the crime on on a police scanner right right and i saw the bikes i talked to the police they didn't seem interested so i drove home and then many years later he comes forward to remind them of the story right and again this is where the police believe that the the vehicle that dan rassier claims he had seen as well as the tire tracks are all they're all accounted for now right. by this guy in this vehicle that, that had nothing to do with the abduction. So therefore, since we don't have a suspect with the vehicle, we're going to assume that the suspect 
was on foot the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then that makes our number one suspect, Dan. Yes. And this is going to be the summer of 2010. Uh, The Stearns County Sheriff's Department conduct an extremely publicized search of the home and property of Robert and Rita Rassier. This is Dan Rassier's parents. He, of course, is still living at home. Um, What do you say? Of course. He's a music teacher. You think at this point. They pay them nothing. I mean, how's he supposed to live anywhere? The arts in this country is going downhill. Um, From the search that they did, they removed several truckloads of dirt as well as removing some of Dan and his family's property from the house. Um, At some point, and I couldn't nail down a date for when this took place, as it may have not been made public, but prior to the search of Dan Rassier, Mm -hmm. he he agreed to meet with Patty Wetterling. Um, And during that meeting, Dan... Dan tells her, I, I don't know if this is at Patty's request or the investigator's request. Or poor Dana, you know. I mean, this guy, you know, this all these like, uh, look, if he's still living with his parents, then there, there's something going on there, right? Wouldn't you agree? I don't know. I, I, I initially. Or, right. And maybe, maybe they're older and he's taking care of them. You know, but what I'm saying is that at some you know, point that becomes the case. Right. I don't know if that's occurring then. Right, but it's just like here's this teacher, and because he lived close to where this uh, event took place, now he's the number one suspect. Now, and and how did that affect his social life after mm-hmm. that and mm-hmm. this small town? And then to come back all these years later and go, okay, well now you're a number one suspect. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have a I have a very close friend that lives with his father. And they have a very large property, uh, right. and it's mm-hmm. too much work for one person to take care of. And this friend of mine, he enjoys working the land and taking care of the place and fixing things up and maintenance and all that stuff. He enjoys right, that right. stuff. He can't afford a big house or a whole bunch of land by himself because he has so many hobbies, so many hobbies that he spends a whole lot of money on. And his his father pro- seems very happy to have him around. They're they're yeah, like yeah. a like a team. Now he does mention from time to time that he's going to move out, but he's been there for forever. Right. So I don't know that that's ever going Someday to happen. I'll, right. Maybe that's the case of, of Dan Rass here, but, um, but this, I feel bad for the guy. Cause it's, you know, I mean, obviously we want to save this. We want to solve this case and we have this, uh, you know, this 11 year old boy went missing and obviously the, the law enforcement wants to solve this case, but man, the casual, the casualties that come through investigations sometimes are awful, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we got this guy that, I mean, like we're talking about him now and he might've done some good things with his life. And all we're reporting on is that he was possibly, or was a suspect in the disappearance of this 11 year old boy. Yeah. Um, this is, this is the thing though. You know, he, he's such a strange variable in this case. And you almost wonder if he had been removed from this case, if he was, if, if his role never took place, if this could have been solved faster, Mm -hmm. uh, did, did, did he just, just his presence alone get in the way of the investigation? Right. Was it like a big decoy? And we talked about him, uh, you know, we started to touch upon that he met with Patty Wetterling at some point. Now the issue here is, I said, I don't know if this was at Patty's request, Dan's request, right. or the investigator's request. My guess would be the investigator's. And I'll tell you why. Because I think Patty comes off to me. And, you know, I don't know her personally, obviously. But but all the interviews I've heard from her, things that I've read that she's done, she seems extremely strong. A yeah. very strong person. And on top of that, extremely smart and kind as well. She's, yeah, she, I think she comes off very authentic. Yeah. You know? It, she she just seems like an amazing person to me as well. And Jerry seems to share those same traits, her husband. Mm-hmm. Now, I wonder here, you know, if the investigators say, you know what? We got this guy and we can't find nothing on him other than he was a quarter of a mile from where your son was abducted. We think he did this. Okay. Right. Now, we also think that he, like you, Patty, is a sensitive, maybe a sensitive person. Mm-hmm. And we think that if maybe if we put the two of you in a room together, if you can handle that, Patty, let's put the two of you in a room together and see if he breaks. Because Dan says during some of his questioning, you know, the police called an interview. He might refer to it as questioning. Some might refer to it as an interrogation. Yeah. But he says that during some of these portions of the time that he's been questioned, 
that they would play video clips of Jared or I'm sorry, of Jacob. Jacob. Yeah. And yeah. they would play audio clips of Jacob. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, this is a way to try to get someone to break down, you know, to, to, to get to that person that's inside and, and get them to confess. Now, during this interaction and during this meeting with Patty Wetterling, uh, Dan tells her where on his property that he is afraid Jacob could be buried. He actually read and he heard several accounts of uh, this. Is, I've okay. actually read and heard several accounts of this. Um, the one that has been reported more than others was Dan had stated that because he was publicly being looked at, and because his property is so large, we are talking about his property is like 25, 26 acres. That's right, a big right. piece of land. Yeah. Dan was afraid that the real killer could return with Jacob's remains and place the body on the property, implicating Dan as the murderer. Mm-hmm. And now, then there's a couple things. One, I if you hear that as law enforcement, you're thinking, well, this guy is just stating this crazy story to cover his ass, mm-hmm. right? Because he did kill this kid. He, he did bury the, the body, and he's using this as a cover-up. So that seems a little fishy. But on the same time, and, and to be in Dan's shoes, think about freaking out. Like, well, look, we have, you know, almost 30 acres. Mm-hmm. You know, so if somebody's reading the news, and, and they could move a body, you know, and, 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 and dig, you know, dig up the body and then bury it on my property. Yeah. Because they know that the cops are looking at me. Well, and they end up searching all of those. I mean, he listed specific areas where he thought that maybe the killer would want to return with the remains of Jacob and place him there. Right. Uh, and he named specific places, and they search all of those places during this highly publicized search. Mm-hmm. Um, now, here's the weird thing, though. Um, this interaction between the two of them, between Dan and Patty, has been reported Many times, but it's been reported differently depending on who you check your sources with. Mm. And some of those reports come out as if Dan was taunting or teasing the grieving mother of a dead child. Right. You know, that that, that he's playing some kind of game here. Right. Uh, and then the other reports state that he's just simply afraid that he's going to be implicated for a murder he didn't con- didn't right. have anything to do with. Right. And on top of that, like I said, the the, the social implications and, and the career implications from him just being involved. Now, I do want to point out that Dan never lawyered up, uh, which some consider lawyer, lawyering up to be a small sign of guilt. Mm-hmm. He did agree to submit to every and any test that law enforcement sought. He, he submitted to a DNA test lie detector test. He even did an interview while under hypnosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and also he's agreed to let them search his car, uh, to multiple interviews as well as a meeting with, with the victim's mother. Well, it seems like he knew that he was innocent and that he was, had some faith in the justice system that it would work itself out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This to me looks very much like the behavior of an innocent person. But if you fear that you are being unfairly accused or harassed by the public news media, or especially law enforcement, by all means, man, lawyer up, you know, lawyer up and submit Uh to their test as requested. Um, So I think he did with, with the exception of the lawyer, I think he did everything as helpful as he could. And he Mm -hmm. tried to be very forthcoming in this investigation. In May of 2014, WCCO TV reported that around the time of Jacob's abduction, there were a cluster of at least six unsolved sexual assaults on boys that were never looked at as a possibility as being a lead in the Jacob Wetterling case. Mm -hmm. These were all taking place about two years prior to the abduction of Jacob and about 30 miles away in Painesville, Minnesota. This took place in 1986 and 1987. There are plenty of similarities here as well. Uh, These attacks are all on boys ranging in age from 12 to 16 years old. These are nighttime attacks. In two of the cases, the boys were riding bicycles. Uh, The attacker sometimes wore a mask. Mm -hmm. And here's the two of the victims from the Painesville attacks as adults um, recounting the events of their attack. It was quite a while since I went back outside at nighttime. I remember I was home that before dark every night. For a while, that was not something I wish on anybody. It was terrifying. Put it that way. 
The Painesville Police Department is seeking the public's support in apprehending a man that has been accosting young men in the Painesville community. So far, there have been five different incidents reported. Sergeant Bill Drager, Painesville Police Department, said, We need help, all the help we can get. This article ran on the cover of the Painesville Press. It's not like it was buried on page five. It ran on the cover. There's an alleyway right here. The Royal Pine Street used to be right here. That's where it happened. It has been so long, I just can't remember all the details of that night, but I, I remember that I was on my way home. I was coming by the, the Gates of Eagle Park, and I turned the corner down to come home here, and some guy just grabbed me off my bike from behind, and I didn't see who it was or nothing, put his hand around my mouth and drug me into the bushes there and said, quiet, I'm gonna, I'll kill you. And he went about his, doing whatever he wanted to do to me, and... What could go through your head? I thought I was going to die, basically, you know. I mean, some guy does that, and then you know he has a knife because he cut your hair. I laid there, and then I ran home and told Mom and Dad, and me and Dad went looking for him before we went and did anything else. But didn't find nothing, of course, and then we contacted the police. That was the end of an era of innocence. I mean, Painesville was the type of town, like any town in Minnesota, there was a 10 o'clock whistle, and at 10 o'clock, you went home. The sergeant, I think it was at the time, was requesting help from the community for these attacks on, on boys, and it didn't sound like they were minor attacks. I mean, the guy said, don't look back or I'll blow your head off. And so there was this threat of a gun. When we started looking into it a little bit, and I started blogging about it, then suddenly I get other people that are commenting and saying, you know, I know another guy, or that happened to me, or my little brother. Suddenly it was just more and more and more, and so five became six, and six became seven, and seven became 12. And my parents were gone, and my oldest brother was there to you know, kind of keep an eye on us or whatever. It's, we were, like we always did, hang out uptown, you know, and it was a weekend. I'm sure I was probably 10 or 15 feet ahead of him and jumped off my bike like kids do, you know, let it roll down, plop to the ground, and uh, started to go head towards the front door, and we had a concrete patio out there, and we had some lawn chairs out there, and I heard something bump into it. Since I seen somebody, you know, dart across the alley, I'm like, oh, I'm not staying around, so I took off running, and I bumped into my brother and I said, hey, I think it's the molester, run. So we ran to the street light and they're headed that way and I looked over my shoulder and I seen a figure there, but I couldn't see a face. It was just all black from the neck up. We got to the street light there and we just yelled for help and luckily one of the neighbors had their window open a little bit and they could hear us. And they said, what's going on out there? You guys need help? We said, yeah, call the cops. You know, uh, somebody just tried to grab us. And this group, they were all tight, and they hung out together all the time, and it was the same group of boys that kept getting um, attacked. They were absolutely terrified. And I don't feel that they ever had a voice in this, you know, that, or that they ever felt that they were taken seriously. I talked to the cop that one night and that was it. No follow-up, no detectives, nothing. Nobody, it was just, it was hush-hush after that. It was, just, oh, it's okay, whatever. They just kind of blew it off. You know, they never talked to us again. You know, the cops never came around and said, well, do you remember anything else? At least I don't remember them, you know, asking me again if, you know, was there anything different, you know, now that you've had time to process it, the description I gave of the guy, and I, you know, I said he was a chubby guy, but I don't, he wasn't. He wasn't chubby at all. I mean, the guy I seen run across the alley was in good shape and could move fast. I hope the Painesville victims know that, that it was not okay. It never was okay. And, and that I hope they do get some justice now. I hope they get some answers. Now, you heard in the clip there, they're talking about uh, an, a mask. You know, the one boy describes when he turns around and looks back, he saw, you know, someone run across the street but couldn't see anything 
from the neck up, it was all black. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I do have a description of a mask that was used in at least one of these attacks. It's described as a homemade mask made from candy-striped indoor or maybe outdoor carpeting. Uh, the attacker had a low, gruff voice, and he threatened most, if not all, of the boys, stating that he had a knife or a gun. You know, and we talked about verbiage with the victim of Jared and how it was similar to what the what Trevor and Aaron heard the things said to them and said to Jacob, um, how the verbiage was the same in those attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we heard in that clip there that, that this attacker had some of that same verbiage. You know, he was saying things like he would blow their heads off um, if they told anybody. And there's also situations from these group of boys. You heard, you heard the one lady talking, saying that the cases, once they started pouring in, it got to the number of 12 of these cases. And in some of these cases, they were boys that were taken from a group of boys. Um, and unfortunately out of these 12 victims with their 12 stories, only two victims were interviewed after Jacob's abduction. The others were not interviewed at all. Right. Which, you know, we'll, you know, looking back on it, we're going to view that as a big, um, a black eye in this investigation. Yeah, and then one thing that we didn't hear in the clip uh, was was some more details of one of the attacks um, from the Painesville victims. A the one boy, well, now a man, says that when he was attacked, that the the man that grabbed the boy off of the bicycle mm-hmm. that grabbed him from behind, uh, he said that the man his hand reeked of cigarette smoke. You know, mm-hmm. this so this person grabbed him off of his bike and and wrapped his hand around the boy's mouth so he couldn't scream. Mm-hmm. And the whole time the boy is smelling this this hand that's reeking of cigarette smoke. So there's one there's one indicator on your suspect along with the the mask, the gun, the knife, the same verbiage and the mm-hmm. you know, the this the, the approximate mask. age of yeah. the uh, of the victims, you know, and another thing that he did too was, um, you know, he, he told him, "Shut up, or I will kill you." This is the boy who was taken off of his bike. Uh, he unzipped the boy's jeans, and he had a knife on this attack. The assailant had a knife here, right. and he used the knife. You said that you heard in the clip. He said he used it to cut my hair. He used it to cut to saw some of the boy's sandy blonde hair off, and took it as some kind of. Like some kind of sick, weird souvenir, I guess. Right. There's a lot of uh, pieces of hair in this case. Now, real quick here, we got to give some props. Some Let's give some big props to a lady named Joy Baker. Um, she is one of the voices that you heard in the clip there. And uh, she should get some big props because she is uh, the reason that this development got brought to light. Um, Joy Baker is a writer. You can find her blog online. She blogs about several things. But for quite some time, she had a blog solely for and regarding the Jacob Wetterling case. Yeah. And she, you heard her say there that, you know, this was not back page news. This was not on page five or page six. When she went out, because she suspected, you know, if there were two boys that were interviewed following the Jacob Wetterling case, Mm -hmm. that there was probably more boys. And she was the one that started to find these boys. She went to the, went to the library, started checking out the microfilm and searching through the old newspapers and found these attacks and started reaching out to some of these victims. And then these other victims come forward and they all have very similar stories describing a very similar guy who's saying the same things. Uh, show, you know, he's got the same weapon in most of these attacks and he's, you know, from time to time disguising himself by wearing a mask. And actually that, that description of that mask, like terrifies me, you know what I mean? When you think mm-hmm. about it, it's like a made a homemade mask from carpet. made from carpet. Yeah. You know, what, what is it just, is it just like a carpet hood draped over your face with two eye holes? I, I didn't see, you know, there's no, there's no uh, evidence of this actual mask other than the victim's description. Yeah. You know, but it's very Zodiac killer to me almost, you know, it's, that's what it reminds me of. And, and it's, it's so much like, you know, this person we talked about, are these all, uh, you know, opportune uh, opportunity attacks, or is this something that this person is working towards or putting some thought into? And clearly in this, in this particular situation he's manufacturing these masks on his own to avoid being you know oh a man wearing a scream mask abducted me well you might be able to trace that at some point 
Yeah, I mean, to me, like I said, I think it's it's somebody that is doing a lot of planning uh, beforehand and then driving around. Controlling. Looking, right, and looking for opportunities. Those boys started coming forward in May of 2014. Now, later that same year, in October of 2014, marked the 25-year anniversary of the abduction of Jacob Wetterling, and there were still no answers. It's still unsolved at this time. Well, Patty Wetterling sat down with CNN, and they mm-hmm. did the following story called Five Questions for My Child's Abductor. Uh, the first question she wanted to ask is, who are you? Uh, she states, I believe that somebody knows. Mm-hmm. It's time to quit protecting the bad guy, even if it is a family member. It's time to speak up for Jacob. Please tell me who took our son. And if you are the abductor, it's time to tell. You cannot feel good about this. Find some peace and write back. Mm-hmm. The next question she asks is, is Jacob still alive? She says that sometimes the phone rings and there's no, there's no one there. It's probably a telemarketer or a wrong number, but her heart cries out, Jacob, are you there? Right. I, and she states that she saves articles of kids coming home after long periods of time, three months, nine months, four months, right. seven, 10, 18 years later. Yeah, you know, she wa- didn't want to give up hope. Yeah, these things can happen. And she states, I don't know, so I hope and I pray that you got away, Jacob. We need you back. We love you more than the flowers love the sun and the rain. My heart wants to be wants to believe that you're okay. Uh The next question was, uh, what made you think you could take a child? Yeah, she says, Jacob is so deeply loved and missed by his mom, dad, brother, sister, cousins, neighbors, and friends. Mm -hmm. I have read a lot about kidnappers and child molesters, and I know that they are all people, human beings, that need help. Maybe you feel bad. Maybe you told someone. But I still live with so many questions, like how could you? And how could anyone s- still keep this secret after all these years? You can free yourself of carrying this. Please explain this to me. And then she would ask, uh, why didn't you let him go? Yeah, she wants to know what happened. You probably had other boys that you victimized and released. I think you meant to let him go and something went terribly wrong. I need to know what happened. Please talk to me. And this is such a tough thing that, you know, a mother would have to go through just even this, this hypothetical questions that she would ask. And the last one being, uh, what was the last thing that Jacob said to you? Yeah. She states that Jacob had a keen sense of fairness and always stood up for people who he thought needed an ally or a friend. He -hmm. probably would have befriended you too. I need to hear his voice again or to hear the last words he said if he can't speak them to me himself, please tell me what he said. And like I said before, I mean, this is a really tough thing that a, a mother would have to deal with. You know, her 11 year old boy goes missing and he's been missing for so long. But I think she took this opportunity to talk to CNN to, you know, one, I mean, just to get the message out to all parents and, you know, protect your children, know where your parent, uh, your children are as much as you can to protect your children let people know that these monsters are real and they're out there and this could happen to your family i think she did it for that reason but i also think she did it for the reason of maybe that the the killer would hear this or the abductor would hear this Mm -hmm. and that he would this would weigh on his conscience and then maybe he would be able maybe he'd come forward maybe he would confess to this or confess to somebody or maybe somebody would hear this and start connecting the dots. And maybe he's had like this extreme stress of always looking over his shoulder because of this one bad thing that he did. Mm-hmm. And she's giving him an opportunity to reach reach out to us and take this weight off your shoulders. Give us some closure. Tell us what happened. Turn yourself in. You won't have to live with this stress anymore, even though she will have to continue to mm-hmm. always live with it. Yeah, but at least you would get some closure. Yeah, and it, that that to me shows the strength of the Wetterling family. Now, and she's on the road to some form of closure and on the way to getting some answers because in 2015, there's a man, and his name is Daniel James Heinrich. He's a white man in his early 50s from Annandale, Minnesota, uh, and he is named as a person of interest in the Jacob Wetterling case. Daniel, or Danny, as he is better known uh, by his friends and relatives, was the subject of a child pornography investigation. They had found 
with him uh, child pornography, most of this involving young boys. And they also found videotapes that apparently Heinrich had filmed himself of boys in public that the boys were unaware that they were being filmed. Right. Law enforcement obviously got a search warrant, but on those warrants, see on these warrants here, they have to state what it is that they are seeking and they have to be somewhat specific about this. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, if you're able to view these warrants, it will give you some insight as to what, uh, what law enforcement officials may actually suspect one is guilty of. So for Danny Heinrich's, uh, search warrant, Mm -hmm. Some of the items that they had listed and that they were searching for included human remains, a red t-shirt with the name Wetterling on the back, a red hockey jacket with the name Jacob on the front. So these are very specific items. And this is, of course, linking him immediately Immediately. to the Jacob Wetterling case. So Danny was facing child porn charges in 2015, but after that he strikes a deal with the prosecutor in the summer of 2016. This is after, I mean, he's convicted before, right? Yeah. He's yeah. actually convicted and he's going to spend life in, in jail for the child por- pornography charges. Well, I don't know if it was life, but it was certainly a good amount of time. I think it, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but I think it was life. So they keep, they, keep, I mean, also mind you that he is an older gentleman now. So, you know, yeah, it, you know, uh, a 30, 40 year sentence could technically be life. So in the summer of 2016, this is when he, he creates this deal uh, with the prosecutor. And mm-hmm. I don't know who came up with the idea of this deal. Um, but the, he ends up leading them to the remains of yeah. Jacob Wetterling mm-hmm. on September 3rd, 2016. Patty says that the remains of her son had been recovered, uh, but she couldn't speak yeah, further on it, the, it was the kinda, issue. It was kind of interesting, though, because you know they may, they had this report that came out that they're going to, you know, he's he is going to tell them where the remains are. Then they had law enforcement out there, and they did find rema- remains. Now the next question was, is this of Jacob or is it somebody else? And and, that, I, and I think the parents had to assume right when they found out that they found remains, they just had to assume and brace themselves for that. It's probably going to be Jacob. Yeah. And there were some details of that, um, confession and that agreement, uh, the plea bargain that they had come up with, Mm -hmm. uh, that we can get into in a bit here, but it was on September 6th that Daniel James Heinrich confessed to the abduction, sexual assault and murder of 11 year old Jacob Wetterling. Now (laughs) here's the thing, Mm -hmm. the whole state, the whole country, you know, the, there wasn't too many people that didn't know about this case, especially in that area. And yeah. so you're talking about, of course you have a family and friends and loved ones of Jacob that have been hurting like you wouldn't believe for so long, but you also ha- almost had a community that was in mourning as well. Mm-hmm. So when the prosecutor came to an agreement with the eventual killer, there was a lot of backlash from the public stating, you know, how could you give a deal to this guy? Right. Um, he ends up getting a deal that would convict him of of only child pornography charges. He's not going to be charged with the murder of Jacob Wetterling. That was part of the deal. Um, and he's only going to receive 17 to 20 years. So he could potentially get out when he's in his early 70s. Now, uh, you're right. But I think it was more important for the family to get closure. Well, it definitely was. And I think here the problem was that they had no evidence against this guy. And a lot, well, and a lot of times too, the law enforcement will actually put, excuse me, they'll actually put the decision on the family. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have this information. He claims that he can lead us to Jacob. Uh, We're going to give him this deal. Is that okay with you? Right. And that's exactly what happened. Now I have heard that had he not been able to lead them to the remains, there were certain stipulations of this. Agreement. Right. Then the deals off. Yeah. If you yeah. can't read, lead us to the remains, we're not going to believe you. Uh, right. Because then, no the fam- deal. Right, then the family gets zero closure. And furthermore, you know, th- they wanted to make sure the Wetterlings agreed to this deal. Mm-hmm. Um, by this point, of course, Patty and Jerry have to, they just kind of have to know at this point, you yeah. know, um, the other thing too is that he had to confess and tell exactly what took place and what exactly happened. And he stated that uh, he had parked his car 
uh, down the road a little bit. He went and he hid. He had saw the boys going to I the told Tom you Thumb. There was, I told you there was a car involved. Yeah, he he saw the boys going to the Tom Thor, Thumb store. Right, right, to rent a movie. And he thought, you know what? I will ambush them on their way back. And he, he kind of put his car at a distance. He abducted Jacob. He he had Jacob in the vehicle with him. They mm-hmm. drove to a remote location. Uh, there he, he assaulted the boy. And he says, he says a couple things happen that, that Jacob had asked him if he, you know, he said he was cold and he wanted to go home. Mm -hmm. And the Danny says, I can't take you home. Um, which, which is weird to me because I had always wondered, you know, the, the, this abduction and what he did almost sounded like a serial, a potential serial offender, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe serial murder. And him saying that I cannot take you home almost tells me that that he determined when he abducted the boy that he was going to kill him. Right. Um, he then told the boy that he that Jacob needed to turn around so that Dan could take a pee. And when when the boy turned around, he shot him in the back of the head. Um, before this took place, I think Jacob was getting a feeling like something wasn't going to work out when when he told him that. He couldn't take him home. Yeah. Uh, Jacob had asked uh, Dan, you know, what did I do wrong? What What did I do wrong? Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a heartbreaking story. There's there's no good of this. I mean, there there has been, you know, the Wetterlings have been so involved in in other uh, helping other children and other families of of these type of crimes. Um, it's it's just heartbreaking to to recount this. Uh, shortly after Jacob had passed away, um, Danny, he stop I, calling him Danny. Like, you know, calm Dan. I don't know why. Well, I apologize, but that's what he's referred to in the news. as. Yeah. Constantly. But it makes him sound like way more innocent for some, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so Dan so, so, Heinrich, yeah. he, he attempted to bury Jacob. Uh, he was unable to do so. Um, he went and found a, I guess there was construction in mm-hmm. the area. Uh, he found a bobcat, you know, one of those little miniature bulldozer type things. And he used that to unearth some ground and he put Jacob in there and he, he buried him. Um, mm. At some point he was questioned. Um, he was yeah. questioned in the Jacob, in the uh, Jared attack um, because he had a vehicle that matched the description that Jared had given the police. Mm. Uh, he also had a police scanner in his car. Um, he ended up, at some point he got scared and he went back to where he had buried the child and he noticed that he didn't do, didn't do a very good job because at some point there was, uh, the jacket was showing was now visible. Mm -hmm. And so he buried the boy uh, one more time. Um, and there, unfortunately Jacob remained until this case was solved or late, you know, last year after they got the answers that they were looking for in the Jacob Wetterling case, um, it was confirmed, uh, Jared, the other victim, uh, who was let go, he, he did say that, yes, after seeing Dan Heinrich, uh, and hearing him talk, he was able to confirm that that was the man that took him. Yeah. Um, and it's also believed and very likely, if not confirmed in some cases that he was also the, the attacker or the uh, attempted to attack other boys in that Painesville area. Yeah. I mean, this if you and I'll post a picture online for you guys to see his mug shots and and then later on there there's there's two shots that I'll I'll send one I think right when he was arrested early in in 2015 and then one a couple of years later or now is is a recent picture but he grew out this beard and he looks a little different but either way this guy is a very intimidating uh individual yeah. and normally I see these mug shots and stuff not super intimidated by a lot of the people, you know, like, you know, Bundy's, I mean, even though he's vicious, doesn't, you know, scare me just on looks alone. But, but this guy, uh, he, 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 there's kind of a chill yeah. the, it, to his eyes and everything. It's very, uh, very evil. Not, not always can you see the monster on the outside, the monster that's hiding on the inside with him. It, it's, it's, like, it's, it's almost obvious, yeah. you know, um, in a sense. And, and one of the things I, I wonder if he had some trauma as a, as a kid himself. 
He he did. That's another long story. Um, right. And but I don't know that he was so much a victim. I've looked into that story. He may have been a victim, so I don't want to put my stamp on anything. Right. But it sounds to me like he may have been a willing participant uh, in some of, in some of that situation. Um, he. He, it, see, yeah, it seems like a lot of times though it's like um like they they're wrestling with something and that maybe that it won't get this far mm-hmm. maybe it won't get to the point where you're actually abducting the kid maybe it's not going to get to the point where you're you're assaulting the kid it's, then it obviously it's not going to lead to you uh abducting them assaulting them and then murdering them and obviously there's something either just off or trauma or whatever but God, you wish that this stuff never happened. And I don't know if he planned to kill whoever he abducted when he set out that night or once he saw the boys. I've, I've I've gone through his statement time and time again, and I go back and forth because, you know, that's like I said, when he says, I can't take you home. Well, right. did that mean like the Jared situation where you drive him somewhat near the right. home or, or, and let him go? Or what if that meant, uh, you know, what if you know what if in the other cases the boys didn't actually see his face and what if in this case he he had the mask off for whatever mm-hmm. reason yeah you know and and therefore because Jacob saw his face that that he he felt that he had to kill him you know he he claims that uh he had heard a police siren at some point and he panicked okay uh, and so. and that's when he when he killed him um i that could be an excuse that very likely could be some kind of excuse. Um, I don't know. See, I go back and forth on that captain, because if you're going to panic, you hear a police siren. I would assume police are near. I'm not going to want to fire a loud gun. Either way, this guy is a sick, evil individual. Yeah. And I'd like to be like, I'd like to try to be like a big, better, more peaceful person than what Uh, I am. And I, I I don't want to be. And I, I, almost regret hearing these words come out of my mouth, but he's going to spend 17 to 20 years. If he gets off with good behavior, yeah, he's but 17, 17 no years. And no, I'm mm-hmm. not saying that it's worth it. I'm not saying it's worth it, that, that it equals, that it equals out. What I'm saying is I wouldn't mind if something, you know, you get a little prison justice. Uh, it happens. Uh, yeah. Well, hopefully that, you know, there, there's some real justice and that, uh, they connect him in other cases and they can tack on charges. I mean, and, and I'm glad that there's some closure for the family, but, uh, you know, I want to see this guy spend the rest of his life in jail. Yeah, they do. They did have some speculation, some stipulations in that agreement. And I don't know that they are allowed legally to talk to him about other cases other than Jared or Jacobs. Um, unfortunately, that's that's the that situation. Do, right. But that doesn't mean that they can't go back and reinvestigate these cases. They know that this monster is behind jail. They have 17 years to figure it out yeah. and keep him behind bars. Yeah. And he so. could have, he could have let Jacob go. That's the thing here. He could have let Jacob go. He let other people go, but for whatever reason, whether he planned it or didn't plan it at some point, he decided that a few years of my freedom is worth more than the life of this child. And it's, I mean, it's the worst of the worst. Right, but it, it doesn't even matter if you if you kept him, you know, if you let him go. I mean, anybody that sexually assaults a kid should spend their life in jail. There shouldn't be like ten years because you ruined somebody's life or you drastically affected somebody's life. Spend the rest of your life in prison thinking about what you did, you stupid piece of shit. You know, that's the way I think. So, all right, let's wrap it up. Okay, again, this week's recommended reading is Hometown Killer, and you can pick that up by going to truecrimegarage.com, click on the recommended page, and see all the books that we've recommended there, and use that by going through the Amazon banner and making a purchase. And a quick thank you to all of you for the support of last year, 2016, and we look forward to doing uh, as many shows as we can in 2017, and it's all because of the support you gave us and reminding you, hey, the best thing you can do is... uh, Give us beer money. No, the best thing you can do is just tell a friend, tell a family member about the show, and that means a lot. That's right. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.
The Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.